I'm glad to be here this morning with you all. I, I appreciate him asking um, me to speak. I really look forward to learning from you all. I hope I can contribute something as well. To kind of give you a little bit of my background and history, I was a, I grew up Southern Baptist. I've served in this, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church my whole life. I ended up, ended up going to a Southern Baptist college. I pastored a Southern Baptist church, and I was there for a number of years for most of my life. And I had met an Anabaptist man that was just very nice. I, I run a small lawn care company, and I was looking to buy a mower, and he sold mowers. And I got to meet him, and I said, you might ask you a couple questions, so I asked a couple questions. And from there, it started my inquiry into Anabaptism and what that was. And over the next year, I, was, I would have considered myself an evangelical pastor investigating Anabaptism, just interested in the subject. After the end of that year, I would have considered myself an Anabaptist pastor, pastoring an evangelical church. Um, and that was fine for about a year. And then after that year, we chose to step out and another pastor took on the church and we chose to pursue Anabaptism. Um, since then, now we've joined with an Anabaptist church just north of us. And now we have the privilege of planting an Anabaptist church uh, where we're at. And I'm excited about that. Um, also, one thing that I've been doing the last year or so is I've become a little, become a little bit of an apologist for Anabaptist theology or Anabaptist and understanding of the faith. It's fascinating, and I, uh, I want to help other devout followers of Jesus understand what kingdom-centric Christianity is all about, how does that flesh itself out in the life, and I want to be able to answer questions. So when you have young or even older pastors or other devout Christians to say, hey, there's more to this Christian thing than maybe what I've been told. There's resources there. So I've been working on that as well. Um, so today I've been asked to discuss the Anabaptist distinction of faith in regard, regards to salvation, discipleship, and gospel sharing. I, I'm not going to talk about the mechanics of salvation um, in my investigation of Anabaptist view of salvation. There are some different approaches. I'm not going to talk about the mechanics of salvation and what that is. I'm going to more talk about how being saved fleshes itself out in the life of a believer. I think that that matters a lot. When I talk to Anabaptists and Evangelicals both, a lot of times what I end up get coming back to, what comes back to me is, well, tell them why, they should, why, why we practice head covering. Okay? Practice, tell them why we should, not, we should uh, hold to non-resistance or non-violence. Hold on, tell them why we should do this, why we should do that. And that stuff matters. But from the evangelical mindset, it's, I can't get from evangelicalism to nonviolence. I can't get from evangelicalism to head covering. It's hard to make that jump from evangelicalism to, to that. And because what happens is we want to go to immediate application. We want to jump straight into, and straight into, well, this is how Christianity looks like. And I think we need to talk about some broader concepts that makes Anabaptism what it is and why we come to the conclusions we do in regards to things like nonviolence, head covering, modest dress, distinction in lifestyles and such. Um, and the answering the question of, are these things really necessary? That, that's one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, are these things that you're practicing, are they really necessary? Do we really have to make a big deal out of head covering? Do we really have to make a big deal out of non bias Do we really have to make a big deal? Are they necessary? And I would be one to say that they are. Um, so I want to talk about these broader concepts that Anabaptists embrace that lead to certain scriptural adherences and a, dis a disciplined life and, a and living out kingdom values. And the three things I'm going to be speaking of is a kingdom-centric gospel, a Christocentric faith, and a discipleship-centric citizen life. I'm going to say it again. It's a kingdom-centric gospel and a Christocentric faith and a discipleship-centric citizen's life. And as much as I wish we didn't live in a time of um, a lot of instability and fear, it's the time that we find ourselves in. And uh, I don't know if this is going to boot up in time. It's an older computer, so I might, I might just leave it. So, but I do, I'm reminded that it's these times when we, when we are, God works in the hearts of people and stirs them to faithfulness. When everything can be shaken, only the things that can't be shaken will remain. I mean, I think that's a pretty clear uh, principle in Hebrews. And there's something about being in the reality of death and war and disease that turns people's eyes upward. It turns people's eyes upward, upward. 
And it's a reminder of the transient nature of this life and the hope that we have in the kingdom of God. So the question comes, will be who of those will answer this call? So again, as we were called uh, in the New Testament to be ambassadors, so who, answers, who will answer this call at this time to stand as ambassadors of an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken? I'm reminded of Hebrews 12, verses 28 through 29. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us be gracious. Let us be gracious, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So the question comes is, who will serve God faithful? Who will serve King Jesus in advancing his nation in the midst of warring nations? We live in a very unique time right now, and you are called to serve King Jesus. You are called to be ambassadors and representatives of this other nation, this so we see warring nations around us. We see tyrannical rulers. We see global schemes. A lot's going on right now. And, if, and the benefit of the Christian life is that we have a hope. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is the kingdom-centered gospel. One of the things that makes Anabaptists a little more distinct than evangelicalism is we believe in what's called a present and coming kingdom. We believe in a kingdom that exists right now on earth. We believe in a now kingdom. And as by being followers of Jesus, we're part of this kingdom it's not just a kingdom that's in evangelicalism we would consider, yes, there's a kingdom, but it's ethereal. You can't see it. You can't touch it. It's out there. We don't know exactly what it is. It's mysterious. And Anabaptists would say, it's not mysterious. The kingdom is visible because the people of God are called to live a certain way. It's, it, the nations of the world can see God's kingdom. It's a now kingdom. And I want to, you to, I want to read to you Colossians 1, 13 through 14, where it says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. This is something that's already happened. We are already in this kingdom. In verse 14, it says, In whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is redeeming sinners and people who are hostile to him and bringing them into his kingdom. He's delivering them out of the kingdom of darkness and bringing them into the kingdom of light. And because of this, we are called to live differently. So the gospel, and in regards to the gospel, it's always been presented in the context of the kingdom. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he preached. And it's this idea that God is building his kingdom, and he's redeeming sinners, and he's granting them, here's a big one, citizenship. He's granting them citizenship in his grace. Now, you all are really big. Again, when I talk to evangelicals, one of the things that really was new to me was this concept of the two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. Yeah, we would have understood that those were opposing each other. We didn't have a real hands-on understanding of what that looked like. But what I could say out of here is that the kingdom of light has invaded the kingdom of darkness and is advancing. Um, in Matthew 11, and I'm just telling you this now, there is a war going on, a war that we don't always see. A war that's going on um, in Matthew 11, verses 11 and 12. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Truly I say to you, among those who are born of women, there is risen no one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has forcefully advanced, and the strong take it by force. There is something going on in the spiritual world where God's kingdom is advancing on this earth. When you look in the beginning parts of the Gospel of John, we're told that when Jesus comes, the light comes into the world, and this light enlightens every man. There was a dark world. It was, it was under sin. It was under bondage. The law made them even more guilty. When Jesus shows up, the kingdom of heaven comes with him. The light breaks forth into creation. It invades the kingdom of, dar uh, kingdom of darkness. And as John says, the kingdom of darkness... And darkness cannot comprehend it, it cannot apprehend it, it cannot stop it, it cannot overcome it. The kingdom of light is advancing, and that's what, the, that's what we are called to do. So when we preach the gospel, it has to be within the context of the kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is growing. Jesus' kingdom is redeeming men and, he is, and redeeming women. He is redeeming people. He's giving them eternal life. It's an everlasting kingdom. That's, the, that's what the gospel is to be couched in. It's to be couched in this idea of the kingdom, and he's... And by doing, by accepting the gospel, it's just not so I can go to heaven. It's so I can be a citizen of this divine kingdom. I am now a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of his dear son. 
And because I'm a citizen of this kingdom, I live differently. So when we preach the gospel, we preach the gospel of the kingdom of God coming amidst the men, redeeming sinners who stand at enmity with God, hostile to God, against God. And God's like, hey, I'm giving you pardon, and now I will welcome you as a son or daughter of me. But as you all know, our war is not physical, but a spiritual one. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we are existing in a spiritual war. This is the reality of the Christian. We were talking about this a little bit last night with, with my wife about the importance of, our, of how we're handling this spiritual war. But it's not a war. It's not a physical war. We're not going to wage war. He is making, waging a war of peace where, you are, where, where the enemies of God are attacking with hatred, violence, and other words. God's people wage a war of peace, an invasion of love. And it's destroying the strongholds of darkness as we stand as ambassadors of Christ. The weapons are our warfare. They're not carnal. And not, 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 not just they're not fleshly. We don't war the way the world wars. Okay? We, that's why when people say, well, why, why won't you participate in any kind of violence? Because that's not how, what our kingdom stands for. Our kingdom stands for peace and love. It doesn't stand for violence. We don't wage war the way the world wages war. We wage war differently. Um, and we stand as ambassadors of Christ. I'm sure you all can remember um, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, So we are ambassadors of, of, for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. This is what an ambassador does. Now imagine an ambassador from the United States going over to another country and say, Listen, you're in hostility towards our country, but our country will grant you citizenship if you're willing to, if you're willing to come on our terms. That's what an ambassador, he represents this other kingdom. That's what ambassadors do. They represent this kingdom. And that's what he's saying. He goes, be reconciled to God. You've sinned against God. His kingdom is here. Be brought into the, uh, to the kingdom. Now, I um, read a book by Finney Caravilla called King Jesus Builds His Church. <laughs> and, and I believe he makes a good point when he says that we should refer to the kingdom as the nation of Christ, because we don't really talk about kingdoms much. We talk about nations. And I do, I do believe it allows us to connect with our context that we're building a nation among the nations, a nation that welcomes all who will bow the knee in faith to our King, King Jesus. And one day they will. One day all knees will bow, either today in loyalty, submission, and love or because they will bow the knee because they, they will bow the knee to Jesus as a foe. That's what faith is. Much of our understanding of what faith is, is it's not just agreeing to a certain set of facts. If I talk to many people from evangelicalism, but I agree with you. Faith is not just agreeing to a certain set of facts. I believe the Civil War happened. I believe that it happened the way most history books would tell it. I believe that the Civil War made some great accomplishments or whatever you could say inside the United States according to the agendas of, this, of the government. It doesn't change my life. The kind of faith is not just an acceptance. Yeah, I believe there was once a man named Jesus who, who lived the earth. And sure, I believe, that he, I believe that he died on the cross. And yeah, I believe he resurrected the dead. That's just the beginning of faith. The beginning of faith knows that Christ is the true king. When you say, I believe in Christ, I believe in Christ, you're saying that Christ is the true king. I, what you're saying is faith commits to his kingship in their life. When we talk about the faith of Abraham, faith of, the faith of Abraham led him to obey. It led him to move. So this faith understands that Christ is the true king. He, this, new, this faith commits to his kingship in their life. This faith conforms the life of this new allegiance and, uh, and citizenship in what we call discipleship. I'm now living the pattern of this new kingdom. I'm now living in, the, in, the, in what this new kingdom stands for. I'm altering my life in every area, not just when I go to church on Sundays. 
but every area is going to be conformed because now I'm a citizen of a divine nation. That's what today's title was, a divine nation. I'm part of a divine nation. I'm going to pattern my life after my king, and I'm going to follow him in discipleship. And, of course, faith inherits the blessing of the nation. Let me say this. It doesn't matter what country you're from. You can be from Canada, and Jesus will love you. It doesn't matter where you're from. <laughs> Jesus will love you. And you, if you will take bow the knee in faith to him and follow him and commit to following him, you could be a citizen of his kingdom, redeemed into his people, have an everlasting kingdom that not only will never fade, you will not fade in it. You will have that everlasting kingdom. The, the, the whole point is, is Christians need to live in such a way that the world accuses us of, they're all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. That's Acts 17, 7. When was the last time the Christians acted so contrary to the culture around them that they said, hey, they're trying to form another country here. They're saying there's another king. You better look out. That's the, what we're talking about. We need to live in such a way that we do stick out amongst the world around us. We don't live like the rest of the world because we're part of another kingdom. And this kingdom is not defined by borders. It's not defined by wall, uh, walls. It's defined by an allegiance to Jesus. So I can go halfway across the globe and find a follower of Christ who's committed to following Jesus. And I've seen my brother and sister. I'm seeing a fellow citizen, citizen of, this, of this nation that I'm in. It's a nation not defined by land, but defined by allegiance. Now, I believe in the, it, it is this context that's missing when we share the gospel. Now, Mark 1.15 says, The time is fulfilled, this is Jesus speaking, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus was preaching that. That was the gospel that Jesus preached, was the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of, the, of this advancing nation. So we're a nation among the nations by Christ and fulfilled and filled by our allegiance to King Jesus. Because we're followers of Jesus, we're this nation. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And again, this nation is not defined by anything except for a commitment to following Christ. That we live by his word and we abide in his presence. We've cast away all things that pollute, dilute, or combat that allegiance. And this should not be foreign to you all. We live as foreigners in our lands for we yearn for the gathering of the nation to our King Jesus. Yes, I was born in America, but I was born again in the kingdom of God. I'm a citizen of God's kingdom first, okay? My secondary citizenship is here. We live in accordance to a higher law, the law of the spirit of the life in Christ. It's Romans 8, 2. We hold that it is possible to have dual citizenship. So you can be a citizen of God's kingdom and citizenship, like I would be a citizen of Ohio, I'd be a citizen of the United States. But I, we do not believe in dual allegiances. I cannot in one breath say I'm committed to following Jesus and living for him and, and now his kingdom will be my kingdom. Oh, but I'm also going to pledge allegiance to the nation I am. We don't, there is no such thing as a shared allegiance. Now you need to understand that even... <laughs> from my background, that that is okay to have that shared allegiance because for various reasons, you can get hyper and you can get pretty nominal forms of it, but it's, it's the, the spiritual and physical worlds are so separated that I can have spiritual allegiances and I can have physical allegiances and they don't necessarily have to conflict. The Anabaptist says all allegiances that aren't for Christ compete with Christ. Jesus said your allegiance is so much that even if, you're, even, if, even, if, even if your spouse says, I'm not going to follow Jesus and I'm not going to go with you, you still have to choose Jesus. Okay? That's the kind of a commitment that Jesus is looking for. It, it impacts every area of our life. Where our allegiances do one. That's Christ the King. We can't serve two masters. Now, Matthew 13 teaches four things about this nation of Christ. And I'm not going to read it because I don't have time, but I will quote it. So Matthew 13, 1 through 9, 18 through 2, uh, 23, is the parable of the sower. And if you know the parable of the sower, he sows some seed on good ground. He sows, he sows some seed on stony ground, stony ground. And, um, and then the seed comes up and he gives this parable. What's the point of this parable? The point of this parable is the message of the nation. Jesus called this the word of the kingdom. That's what he called it. The, the word, Matthew 13, uh, in uh, 1 through 9 and 18 through 23, Jesus says, this is the word of the kingdom. And not everybody's going to accept it. You know, there's going to be good soil and bad soils. But 
the point he's making here is that there's a message of the kingdom. Christ reigns. He's conquered death and gives eternal life to all those who call on him in faith. Repent, believe, and call on the name Jesus as Savior and King. That's the message of the kingdom. Now, that's not sufficient when, uh, because of time this morning. But we have the word of the kingdom. We're spreading the message of the nation or message of the kingdom. That's the element, first element, Matthew 13, about the nation of Christ. Now, the second is citizenship in the nation. And this is Matthew 13, verse 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. And this is the parable of the wheat and the tares. And this parable, the first one was about the word of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom. The second one is about the sons of the kingdom, the children of the kingdom. Who are they? And the whole point of this parable is that Jesus is the one who sows the sons of the kingdom throughout the world. Okay, he throws, he's casting out wheat, and then the evil one sows tares. Now, from my background, we actually just had this conversation recently, would say, well, there's tares in the church. Brother, you're going to have tares in the church, tares in the church. This context of this parable is not the church, it's the world. And the, the, the implication of that parable is that Jesus is sowing his children all throughout the world, and these are the ones producing fruit from the kingdom message from the parable before. And he sows them into the world, and they're producing fruit, and they're winning people, and they're preaching this, and they're sowing the message of the kingdom. They're sowing the message of the kingdom. But the whole point is, is that these sons of the kingdom are everywhere. These sons of the kingdom are everywhere. We're citizens of a nation that's dispersed throughout the world, sowing the message of the kingdom as we produce fruit from the good seed sown into us. Remember the first one was about the word of the kingdom producing fruit in our lives. The second one was our lives producing fruit in the world. That's the second parable. The third parable is the pervasiveness of the kingdom. And these, this is the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of leaven. You remember, he plants a mustard seed. It's a very small mustard seed. Plants it, it becomes a large bush and a large tree, and the birds nest in its branches, and the leaven, he puts a little bit of, they put a little leaven in the dough, and it expands, and it grows. This is the pervasiveness of the kingdom. This kingdom is going to pervade over the earth. This nation is pervading throughout the world, and one day will fill the earth with the glory of her king, and that's in Matthew 13, 31 through 33, and the fourth is the treasure of the nation. And this is the two parables, the pearl of great price and the treasure hidden in the field. The pearl of great price, the merchant goes and he sells everything he has to buy this um, pearl of great price. The one finds treasure in a field, sells everything he has, and then goes and buys the field. That's the mindset of someone who understands what this kingdom is. It's the treasure of the kingdom. And this kingdom is so valuable, so precious, it's worth walking away from everything. It's worth walking away from everything. When, when, I was, when my wife and I were in the middle of our, of our transition, we knew that we were walking away from everything that we ever knew. And every time I'd say, well, Lord, isn't this good enough? Isn't it close enough? Why can't, why can't I just stay here? This is very comfortable. In fact, when I left, my hope was that the... Um, that the people I talked to would talk me back into it because it would have been so much easier if I could just stayed there and been comfortable. And Jesus, he kept coming back to this, do you love me? Do you love me enough to follow me even in this? If this is right and you know it's right, why would you live in hypocrisy and, and not follow? We have to find it. It's got to be your, it's got to be a treasure. It's got to be a treasure to you. The kingdom has to be a pearl of great price. Because it has to mean more to you than anything else in your life. The treasure field has to mean more to you than anything else in your life. That's the amount of commitment and allegiance Jesus is calling for. The kingdom of God is so precious and so valuable that I'm going to get rid of everything in my life that will keep me, that will keep me from it. I'm going to surrender everything in my life to this new king so I can experience this treasure uh, in Jesus of his kingdom. And that's in Matthew 13, 44 through 46. One day he will make all things new. He'll make all wrongs right. And there'll be a new heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. So the first one, again, was a kingdom-centric gospel. When we preach the gospel, we must preach it with the context of the kingdom. And the way I tie it was Christ, the way of the king. 
we need to be saying that a lot. When we are sharing the gospel, we need to very, make very important that Jesus is king. Jesus is king. His kingdom, if you want to use the word nation, we're a nation among the nations. But the fact is, is that the gospel needs to be preached in the context of the kingdom. So when you're saying, someone says, well, I want to be saved. Say, well, say, well great. You want to be saved? Well, God's building his kingdom. And by doing so, you have eternal life. You're also going to become a citizenship citizen of this kingdom. And by doing so, you're going to, you're going to fellowship with this, this kingdom. You're going to adopt its values. You're going, to, you're going to be discipled away of the king. The He showed us how to live. We're going to live differently. The, other, the next one is a Christ-centered faith. Um, Christ, the arbiter of truth. A Christ-centered faith. Christ, the arbiter of truth. Now, over the years, I have stood in the pulpit and I have declared over and over and over the need for a biblical church. And sometimes I pounded on my pulpit and my face turned red when I was doing it because that's what we did. And the need for a biblical church. We need a biblical church. We need a church that follows the Bible. Amen? Amen. We need a church that follows the Bible. That's what we need. You don't get me started. We're going to go down that road if you do that. I stress, I stress that our faith needed to align with what the scriptures taught and how we needed to follow the scriptures no matter what and, and that we needed to esteem this book so high that we were willing to conform our church and our lives to everything that it taught. And I think, and we emphasize the priority of the book. When I was in college, Baptist college, they said, we are people of the book. That's what they called themselves, people of the book. And as a conservative Baptist, I emphasize the priority of the book. And the Bible is the sole authority for all faith and practice. So the all faith and practice, the sole authority, the final authority is the Bible. And that, that's, that is the authority for all faith and practice. But let me ask you, let me tell you something that might trigger you, and that's good. What have I told you if that's not enough? What have I told you that it's not enough to say, I want a biblical church and I just want to follow everything it teaches? The last year and a half, I was at my church. I was pa- preaching, pa- uh, pastoring my church. I preaching through the Gospel of Mark, and I didn't. And I and I actually titled the sermon series. Just so you know, after a year and a half, we only made it to Mark eight. So we were going nice and slow through the Book of Mark. And I I, I titled the series "Following the Footsteps of Jesus Through the Gospel of Mark," and that was my intention. I didn't realize the impact that that during that time was going to make an impact on my life because it it was i think it was divinely ordained that i was meeting the people i met i was preaching through the gospel of mark and i had and at the time at the church we had already dealt with a level of corruption that had been in the church for a few decades we had overcome that we had done all the hard stuff we had been through the storming stage we i think the next one was the normal we were at the normal normalizing stage the norming stage we were there and we were almost getting into the performing stage we were, I mean, pastors were like, John, you are, you've done it. You've made it through the hard. Now you've, now you've got a church that you're moving forward. And we were able to overcome the contention and move forward. And at that time, I felt, like I said, we need to start preaching the gospel. Mark, I didn't realize the change that God was working in my heart through that gospel. Now, there are many evangelicals that would say that there's no meaningful difference between Anabaptism and evangelicalism. That is the one thing that I face all the time. There's no meaningful difference. Oh, we agree. Oh, we think we agree with you. Or, there's, or this is all secondary issues. I hear that a lot. These are all secondary issues. They're not secondary. There are meaningful differences between conservative mainstream evangelicalism and Anabaptism. And one of the distinctions that makes Anabaptism what it is is that we believe that Jesus is the arbiter of truth. In that we believe that all claims and disputes of truth are settled in Christ. All claims and disputes of truth are settled in Christ. That's one reason why when I talk to my evangelical counterparts and they're signing their children to go up into the military and they go to the Old Testament and they say, see, they fought wars. Yeah, but Jesus said we are to be known for our love for enemies, not for our willingness to war. And because Jesus is the arbiter of truth, he he supersedes what we think the Old Testament is allowing the Christian to do, and thus we don't participate in that. Now, pastors, again, and authors make the claim that the Bible is the final authority for the believer, and this is the widespread belief held by most conservative evangelicals. You're going to find that probably regardless of what background you go to, that all claims of truth are settled by the scriptures, and that's true. In fact, the problem is, is we have hundreds 
of denominations. Hundreds, of, I don't know if we're up to the thousand yet, hundreds of denominations that would say that and that would say claim the Bible as their final authority. That's what they would say. What does the Bible teach about itself? Well, the Bible teaches that it is the special inspired revelation of God to which we should, ch we should cherish, read, um, and study and memorize it. Paul says in 2, uh, 2 Timothy 3, Second Timothy 3, you probably all know this by heart. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures are sufficient for the disciple of Jesus. They are sufficient. That everything that we need as a disciple of Jesus are given us in scriptures. They are, they, they are God's special revelations. They're the very words of God. The Bible is God's special revelation, revealing truth, the design, the plan of God. And it's the revelation we have divine. When I read my Bible, I'm in relationship with God. When I am reading the scriptures, I am in relationship with God. But you need to, uh, but what, um, and so just to continue that on that, on that thought, I believe that it, the Bible is inspired, it's preserved, sufficient for the believer to know God and his will and his design. And we ought to care, carefully study and fulfill it. I believe it is fully sufficient. They're sufficient for the disciple of Christ. But the final authority for the disciple is the personal revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation of God. The Bible is sufficient to bring us to Christ. And we read that in John 5, 38, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He said, or verses 39, John 5, 39, says, You search the scriptures because you... Because you would think in them you have eternal life. These are they who bear witness of me. Yet you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. The scriptures are extremely important, preserved. Actually, I hold a very, very elevated view of the scriptures. But how, when I approach this book, when I approach these writings, when I approach this inspired, um, a preserved word of God, when I approach this precious holy book, and I hold it in my hand, and I read through its pages, and I, and I meditate on its words, and I, and I cherish every minute of it. I always have to read it through the lens of Jesus. That's, again, it's called a Christocentric hermeneutic. And because I'm reading through the Bible through this lens of Jesus, everything I understand, and from my, again, from my background, from evangelicalism, the most prominent understanding of faith is it's something called dispensationalism. I'm not going to go too far into it. But it's the idea that we are now under the age of grace. You've heard that age of grace, uh, the church age, all that. And ultimately what it ends up doing is separate, often, often separates out Jesus' teachings from the rest of the New Testament. We ought never to do that. We ought to start with the teachings of Jesus and from that, from that cornerstone of Jesus' life and teachings, understand how the apostles wrote. And understand that they started there too. Paul did not write to supersede Jesus. Paul wrote be, uh, from the foundation of Jesus' life and teachings. Um, so the final authority for the disciple of Jesus is the personal revelation of God in Jesus Christ. So the scriptures are sufficient to bring us to Christ. But then Jesus is authoritative to interpret everything the Bible says. Jesus when he would teach, they, would, they would said, they said, he teaches as one who has authority. Jesus is the one who's authoritative to interpret everything we read in the Bible. And if you, I'm going to turn to John here real quick, John 1. This is a, I was answering a pastor who was, he was coming up to me in, in, in regards to the scripture. He goes, but John, all the scriptures are theonoustos. It's one Greek word we all know. God breathed, okay, inspired. All the scriptures are theonistic. When I was in college, John, the red words have no more weight than the black words. So the black words hold just as much weight than the red words. So you can't just elevate the red words. And I disagree. I disagree. And here's why. In John 1, verses 17 and 18, we read, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only Son who's at the Father's side has made him known. Now, let me go through this. So the law came through Moses, and two things come through Jesus, grace and truth. Um, 
And the way we would have understand it, we would, uh, we would always go to Paul for understanding of grace, but Jesus was, was grace personified, and he was truth personified. They came through Jesus Christ. And then he makes this claim in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only son, or the only begotten son, the only brought forth son, um, who is at the Father's side or in the Father's presence or at the fa- in the Father's bosom, has made him known or has declared him. The word there means he's expounded him. He's, he's revealed who he is. And if Jesus, being in the most personal form of kind of per, of, for us to be able to understand who God is, revealed God to us in a way that we could see, touch, and feel. When John wrote his epistles, uh, in 1 John, he, he's going against the, uh, the, uh, the Gnostics, and he makes this case that Jesus was the physical manifestation of God in every way. He says, and he said, which we have looked upon, our hands have touched concerning the word of life. And, uh, oh, beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, our hands have touched concerning the word of life. Jesus is the perfect personal revelation of God. And being such, he shows us what God is like. If I have an interpretation of scripture that contradicts what Jesus said or lived or revealed about God, then my interpretation's wrong. Jesus is the arbiter of truth. So if I have an interpretation of Scripture that contradicts something that Jesus said either Sermon on the Mount or other various teachings, I'm wrong, and I need to turn back to Christ because Jesus revealed the Father perfectly. In Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, It says, God, who at various times and in diverse ways spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the world. He is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholds all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Listen to the claim that the author of Hebrews is making here. God has spoken through his son. He's heir of all things, and, he made, and through whom he made the world. He is the brightness of his glory. That's what glory is. And if, in glory, and so everything that God has revealed about himself comes in the face of Jesus Christ. It's 2 Corinthians 4. And just because I'm here, I want to I wanna read it because... He makes a really great case for this. For God, I'll read verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. I'm not undermining scripture when I say that Jesus is the perfect personal revelation of God. And it is through his person, his teaching, and his life by which I understand all the other writings as holy as they are. So we read Hebrews 1 through 3, and he tells us about this express image of his person, and he upholds things by the word of his power. And then we read in um, Matthew 28, where he says, in Matthew 28, 18, you all recognize this. And Jesus spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So when an evangelical say, our final authority is the Bible, our final authority is Jesus. And by that, I understand the authority of the Bible. The Bible has authority in my life be- because of Jesus. Jesus, by promoting a Christocentric hermeneutic, I'm not undermining scripture. I'm actually understanding scripture to its fullest extent in the personal revelation of God found in Jesus. And 
John seems to be making the case in his gospel that Jesus keeps saying, hey, I'm saying the things that my father told me. I'm doing the things that my father does. I'm what you see me doing, the father's doing. And he's making this picture, not, that, not just that he is God, but that he is the perfect revelation of the father. Over and over and over. I, uh, John 5, 19, 5, 27, 7, 17 through 18, 7, 28, 8, 42, 12, 49, 14, 10, 17, 2, and it can go on. Jesus keeps saying, when you look at me, you see the Father. What the Father's doing, I'm doing. What the Father says, I say. And that's very important because if I want to get to know the Father, I need to listen to Jesus. And when I want to hold the, the book that God, in, that God inspired, I must understand it through the person of Jesus. So through the scriptures, we come to Christ, but through the life and teachings of Christ, the scriptures are illuminated or illumined. And I love Hebrews where it says, if, uh, it talks about scripture being a two-edged sword. If the scriptures are a two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, then Jesus is the one who wields that sword. Now I'm going to read to you Hebrews 4, 12. In 13, it says, For the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierces even the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no creature that is not revealed in his sight, for all things are bare and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. The word of God is alive and active, and it's alive and active because it's illumined by the word of God, the logos of God as revealed in Jesus. So we're in no way undermining the word of God when we say that the logos of God is the lens by which we interpret the scriptures. In fact, again, we're giving the basis for the authority of the scriptures in the life of the disciple of Jesus. All true interpretations of scripture come through the life and teachings of Christ, and thus all true faith must have as Christ as its center. All true faith, all true interpretation of scripture must have Jesus at the very center. And from that, you get to nonviolence. From that, you get to a submission of life to Jesus. From that, Jesus makes very clear what a disciple is. And from the life of teaching Jesus, he makes it very clear. So when I read Paul's writings about grace through faith, and they are amazing and they're wonderful that we are saved by grace through faith, I read it through the lens of that same grace that saves me there, helps me, moves me over into living a life as a disciple after Jesus. Um, and then my last point, so I, just to kind of recoup, because I have a couple minutes here. Um, the first point was the kingdom-centered gospel, Christ the way of the king. And um, I meant to read, I think I forgot, but John 14, 6 uh, says, um, I am the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So you'll notice that pattern here. Um, so Jesus, the way of the king, is a Christ-centered, a kingdom-centered gospel. And then the next one was the, um, the Christ-centered faith. Carp's the ar arbiter of truth, the way, the truth. So now we have the arbiter of truth in Jesus. And lastly, a, a discipleship-centered citizen's life, or a citizen-based discipleship. And this is Christ, the key of life. Now, there are calls today, and I don't know if you know this, there are calls today from the United Nations, if you don't know what it is, it's like an accumulation of world governments, for people to kind of renounce their national citizenship and, and adopt a global citizenship. I don't know, you might actually be hearing it on, if you do, if you ever watch the news, you'll hear that they're using the term, I'm a global citizen, I'm a global citizen. And the idea, and this is not a conspiracy, it's, you can find it on their website, so it has to be true. <laughs> but the idea is that we're all global citizens and I don't think you should have thought you're going to get out this weekend without talking about the new world order at least once but here's what it says it says global citizenship and this is from the United Nations is the umbrella term for social, political, environmental and economic actions of globally minded individuals and communities on a worldwide scale the term can refer to the belief that individuals are members of, a mul of multiple diverse local and non-local networks rather than a single actors affecting isolated societies. Basically what they're saying is no more national sovereignty. There's no such thing as nation states anymore. Promoting global citizenship and sustainable development will allow individuals to embrace their social responsibility to act for the benefit of all societies, not just their own. Now, you should be recognizing some of this because you all probably have at least heard the winds of America first politics. 
that's where a lot of this stuff is coming from. So the concept of global citizenship is embedded in sustainable development goals through SDG4, ensuring inclusive and quality education for all and promoting lifelong learning, which includes global citizenship as one of its targets. By 2030, so within seven or eight years, the international community has agreed to ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including global citizenship. Universities have a responsibility to promote global citizenship by teaching their students that they are members of a large global community and cause their skills and education to contribute to that community. So that is one of the biggest pictures that you're seeing in, the, in our political world. And there's a lot to be said about this, and I'm not here to talk about it. I'm here, but I'm using it of how this intersects with Christ's kingdom, because Jesus's nation is a global nation, but it's not the United Nations. Now, how Christians have responded to this, and this kind of gives you maybe some basis from, from evangelicalism, is some Christians, many Christians, have reacted to this G, uh, agenda with calls for national sovereignty, national sovereignty. So basically, we need to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world, and even for Christian nationalism which basically is the idea that this is God's country and it's a Christian nation and we're going to stay away from the new world order. But for kingdom-minded or nation-minded or kingdom-minded Christians, you understand that your citizenship is in Christ's nation. Your allegiance is not tied to a certain land, border, wall, it's tied to a person, to Jesus. Christ's nation doesn't promote a secular kingdom. God's nation is a divine nation with its own sets of culture, its own values, and it will be in conflict God's kingdom is in conflict with national sovereignty. God's kingdom will be in conflict with global sovereignty. Within the next 10 years, there's going to be a lot of wrestling with this. Let me encourage you to cling on to Jesus and maybe release some of those strings that you're starting to tie with national politics. Amen. Let them go. Jesus is building his own nation, not America. So when I talk about some differences between evangelicalism and anabaptism, Jesus' kingdom is as real to me as any kingdom. In fact, more real. Okay? His teachings and words held just as more weight in my life than the Constitu Constitution and Bill of Rights that they hold to. Now, I will respect them because we live in America. I, Romans 13 clearly teaches I should respect governing authorities and that they're there for a reason. But my allegiance is to Jesus and his kingdom. And when and, when and if this global citizenship actually comes into fruition, comes into reality, there will be conflict between earthly and heavenly allegiances. There have always been conflict between earthly and heavenly allegiances. But if you look at Jesus and his life, his teachings, he keeps saying, let go of the earthly allegiances, cling on to the heavenly allegiance, set your mind, set your affections on things above where Christ is. That's the whole point, is we believe in a right now kingdom. It's not just a kingdom that's going to come in the future. Yes, it will come, to full, it come in full glory in the future, but I believe that I'm in a kingdom right now. And that kingdom is the kingdom of Christ. Now, I'm going to go into Romans 10, 9 through 10 real quick. Because Paul calls on the Romans to not revoke the Roman citizenship. If you read through the book of Acts, you know that Paul used his Roman citizenship and he ended up appealing to Caesar and he ends up going, um, ends up going to Rome. Um, he, so he doesn't ask them to revoke their Roman citizenship, but he does ask the Christians to revoke their allegiance to Caesar. Where do you see this? Well, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Um, Paul says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. Okay? This is the word of faith. So we're saved by grace through faith. This is that word of faith. What is it? 
that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's he saying here? Well, in the context of what Paul's saying here, the Romans were supposed to say Caesar is Lord. And Paul is saying Jesus is Lord. Now listen, there was, Paul never revoked his citizenship. He never said, okay, I, I'm revoking my Roman citizenship. He never said that. But he's not asking us to do that. What he is saying is you have to revoke your allegiance to a physical nation to adopt God's divine nation. My allegiance is now to Jesus. Remember that saying back in Acts 17 where they said, they're, they're co acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. There's another king, Jesus. Don't you think that's threatening? That's what Paul's getting at. We have to say Jesus is Lord. And that's where our allegiance lies. And it says, so this, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord, and that you believe that God raised him from the dead. So there is belief and faith, but it's also a committed. So when we talk about faith, we, we talk about a committed faith because biblical faith is a committed faith. Um, and so one believes in the righteousness with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So we must confess our mouth, with our mouths our allegiance to our heavenly citizenship above that of national or international citizenship. And then Philippians 3, 20 through 21 says, but our citizenship is in heaven from where also we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our body of humiliation so that it may conform to his glory as a body according to the working of his power, even to subdue all things to himself. See the contrast here? Our citizenship is in heaven with Christ. That's a real citizenship, and we live out that citizenship. So when we talk about discipleship, why do you, why, why do you practice head coming? Why do you practice modest dress? Why are you living by these scriptural distinctions that most, most of the church has given up on? Because we're part of a different kingdom. Now, I'm going to say this. That doesn't mean I make up new rules. I think scripture is sufficient to tell me what that looks like. But we are to be faithful to live out that design. Um, this is, so this is where we begin discipleship. So if I begin, if I talk to a new disciple of Christ and they're following Jesus, say, I'm going to follow Jesus, great. You're now a citizen of his country and, and you're a citizen of his nation. And by such, by such we, you, um, we follow the constitution of the gospels. You say, well, where's the constitution of, of the gospels? Discipleship must come from a place of citizenship in God's nation. We are citizens of God's nation. We are children of God. And because of that, um, we uh, are follow suit in discipleship. So discipleship is learning to live as a citizen of a divine nation, a heavenly nation on earth, as God's servants, both human and angelic, serve his universal divine plan. And this means that discipleship is not alone, but universal as citizens of Christ's nation. Now, I'm not talking about ecumenicalism. I'm not... not I'm not talking about that because not all religions are one, but there's only one that should our allegiance be committed to. So as with all church history, the global citizenry will conflict with God's heavenly citizenry, just as national citizenry, how many times I can put that in, has in the past. And I would go further, but I do want to focus on discipleship real quick. The nation of Christ is a real nation. It's not ethereal, it's not fake, it's not invisible. It's a real nation. You are part of a real nation. If you are a follower of Christ, you are a citizen within his nation. It's a real nation. And you are, that resides beyond, above, amidst, and throughout the nations of the world. Again, it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your background is. All that matters is you, you bow the knee in faith to Jesus. And now you're following him as a disciple. You're a citizen of his kingdom. And as such, you will live out what he teaches. This kingdom is sufficient in all respects to be a nation, and discipleship is learning to live as citizens of this nation of disciples. We pattern our lives after that of Christ our King. Christ is our King, so we pattern our lives after him. We adopt the values and truths granted us in its constitution found in the Gospels. Jesus revealed it there. We adhere to the truth, design, and ordinances laid out in the New Testament the church, when we talk about these New Testament teachings that, that most of the modern church has tossed aside, that these are distinguishing mark of Christ's nation amongst the nations. 
So when we talk about head covering, modest dress, non-resistant lifestyle, things like that, those are markers of being a citizen of Christ's kingdom. And we should live those out. So the New Testament doesn't just give us doctrine to be believed, but a design to be lived. And as an Anabaptist, one of the things that really convinced me was God's design is good, and we should rejoice in God's design, not suppress it, make excuses for it, or reject it. If God's design is good, then I should follow it and live it and rejoice in it. So we align our lives to the larger purpose of this nation and her King Jesus. We abide in him and bear fruit from his sufficiency, and we live in abundant intimacy with our King as individuals and abound in the nation of the saints. And from this program, our lives are transformed into a heavenly citizenry beyond what the world can grasp as we eagerly await the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me read to you two more passages and then I will be done. Verse nine, uh, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, Now therefore you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Do you hear what he said? You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the entire building tightly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. And then Titus 2, 11 through 14 says, For the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly, righteously, and in godliness in this present world, as we await the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a special people or peculiar people, zealous of good works. So just to reiterate, it's a kingdom-centered gospel, Christ, the way of the king. The gospels always be preached within the context of the kingdom or the nation of Christ. Number two, a Christ-centered faith, Christ, the arbiter of truth. All true interpretations of scripture have Christ as their center and as their true hermeneutic. And then a citizen-based discipleship or a discipleship-based citizenry, Christ, the key of life. We are called to be citizens of his kingdom, of his nation, and as such, we don't look right to the world.